Welcome to the Company of Dads podcast, where we explore the sweet, silly, strange, and sublime aspects of being a lead dad in a world where men, who are the go-to parent, aren't always accepted at work, among their friends, or in the community for what they're doing. I'm your host, Paul Sullivan. Our podcast is just one of the many things we produce each week at the Company of Dads. We have various features, including the Lead Dad of the Week. We have our community, both online and in person. We have a new resource library for all dads called the Lead Dad Library. The one-stop shop for all of this is our newsletter, The Dad. So sign up today at thecompanyofdads.com backslash the dad. Today, our guest is Barney Banks, who is many things, including being way more interesting than me. Barney's always been an out-front public guy, and these days he's a UK super dad. Out of university, he was a professional dancer, including stints on Britain's Got Talent. He's done modeling, and he's a commentator for eSports, which takes him all over the world. But we're talking to him today for his TikTok persona of I Am Mr. Banks, which has amassed 48.6 million likes on his parenting and fatherhood posts. And it all began when he did something every father has done thousands of times, changed his son's diaper. Barney, welcome to the Company of Dads podcast. Thank you very much for having me. How's it going? It's going great. How does it all get started? How do you, you know, most people leave <laughs> university and they get, you know, a pretty boring job, an internship job. You leave university and say, screw it, I'm going to become a professional dancer. Tell us that yeah. story. Give us that backstory first. Well, I guess that that story kind of began when I was 17, actually. So uh, in the kind of latter years of secondary school, uh, I a guy joined my school, uh, one of my peers, who then I found out halfway through the year that he was going to dance classes on the weekends while all of us were competing in sports, whether it be football season or rugby season. And uh, I caught wind of this and I'd always been interested, but never had an introduction into the world of dancing. And uh, he invited me to tag along to go to a dance class at a very famous dance studio in, in central London called Pineapple Studios. And after my first class, I was hooked. I was like, yeah, that's it. So I'd make up every excuse in the book to get out of doing sports on the weekends so that I could go and, um, you know, take dance classes. And then from that, I kind of led into this, I think I want to do this for my job. I, I guess there was an element of going to university to kind of, please my parents to kind of complete the education journey. And then I can, if I still want to, you know, embark on a journey as a, as a, as a dancer, then I can, then I can do that. So yeah, I, I trained as a dancer as, along the same pathway of, you know, a, a university degree in film. Yeah. So when I left university, I was like, cool, let's do this dancing thing for real now. And you did. And I did. Yeah. And then that turned into a, a six year career as a professional dancer from the age of 21. When I graduated from university, I moved, moved to LA for a few months so that I could train amongst, you know, the best dance teachers that there are, because you're, you're training with Justin Bieber's choreographer and Usher's choreographer and Justin Timberlake's choreographer. You're just, you know, you're in that mix of people because the, one of the great worth ethics work ethics in the dance industry is that in LA, all the people that are the top dancers, they all still take class all the time. And that's why they're the top dancers. So the actual, uh, the kind of the training that you're getting by going to these, these studios in LA is, is second to none. Now, Barney, you and I met through your brother, Ollie, who is a yeah. first rate, great guy. <laughs> yeah. uh, golfer, golf agent. I played golf with him. He has ex exhibited no talent whatsoever that would lead me to believe that <laughs> dancing runs in yeah. his family. So when you think about making this move, and it worked. I mean, this is, you know, we're going to get to fatherhood. This is fatherhood is too, is yeah. kind of literally taking a leap. Um, was there ever, I mean, when you did this, what did your parents say? What did your older brother say? How did that you know, was it w when you first started to take off that they said, okay, I, I guess Barney's not insane. You know what, how did that work? <laughs> you can imagine the, the barrage of, of insults and, and jokes that were made at, at family gatherings. Yeah, of course. So, um, I guess the, the first time my parents, not necessarily my parents, my mum had always had like a level of understanding of just follow your dreams. My dad had his head screwed on a little bit more in terms of just make sure you're financially okay. And then I don't care what you do, honestly. So just like go for what you want to do. And then obviously with my brother, as a as I was kind of 
saying to him I wanted to pursue the dancing side of things, he was like, well, I'm still going to make fun of you, but <laughs> ultimately if it works, it works. So I guess we were all pretty open-minded about it. And then when people sort of realized, I think it's when I, when I booked the job, it was one of two. It was either when I booked the job to be a uh, on-site dancer for Britain's Got Talent, meaning that you dance for any of the contestants that are competing that year. You are one of the dancers that they have readily available for them. So if they decide they want backup dancers for their show, then you're brought into that and then you have to learn choreography and et cetera, et cetera. It was either that because that was a longer contract. You've got to remember in the commercial world, dance, in, dance contracts are very short they're always less than a week long unless you do a show in the West end, which is years long. So, you know, every time you do a music video, it's only three days work, two days of rehearsals, one shoot day done. Um, so with Britain's got talent, it was like a six week job. And so that was a really big deal. And then, you know, I guess when I told them the financial, uh, benefits of doing a job that was that length, they, they kind of were like, Oh, okay. This sounds like this could be something that has legs. <laughs> and I guess that that was one, or it was, you know, the stature of the job, which was I danced for Elton John at the O2 Arena uh, for the Brit Awards. And that was, uh, you know, that was a big deal. Like as a, as a dancer, to be able to say that you shared a stage with someone like Elton John was pretty cool. Uh, that is a very big deal. You know, <laughs> yeah. when, we, when we think about fatherhood, we think about, you know, juggling a lot of things. We think about being able to make decisions on the fly. When you and I have talked in the past, um, you've told me both about your career as a commentator for esports and also your previous dance career and, and things that stuck out to me that may be related, maybe not, I could be making this up, but that when you were a dancer, professional, that you had to learn all kinds of routines very quickly. You had to get it down and get it down right or else obviously somebody else would fill your spot. Same thing yeah. with, with esports. You know, when you got into this, uh, you have to learn all of the top players. You have to know about them. You have to know what they're doing. Tell me about how you developed those skills in your professional life and if you think that they carried over into your your parenting life yeah i believe that especially when it comes to esports like hosting um the the additional pressure of having to remember all the ins and outs of the game to a high level aren't as high pressure as being a host that i guess for a commentator you need to know absolutely everything the whole game inside out but as a host you can dabble and as long as your conversational skills and interview skills are up to scratch, then, you know, there is an element of you can ride that wave. So I guess it's been more about in improving my capability to interview anyone under any circumstance, rather than knowing each and every game that I work in back to front, because there's so much information. There's so much history in these esports, especially the esports that have been going on for longer than three or four years. And, you know, you have all these transfers, you have players, they, they the gossip about salaries and the, the kind of the interactions between each of these players at different tournaments all over the world. It's so hard to stay on top of absolutely everything that you, tr you, quite, you try to cherry pick everything. And the fortunate thing about the host is I don't get quizzed on stuff. I quiz people <laughs> on stuff. So I can kind of, again, ride that wave. So... In terms of carrying over these sets of skills of being able to juggle, it, it, yeah, thinking on the fly, definitely. I guess for me, everything that's fallen under my career path, whether it be dancing, whether it be hosting, radio, et cetera, has given me this ability, I guess, to just entertain. And so hence why this social media side of my life has you know, improved and, and you know, gathered some sort of momentum is because... I love to entertain. So I love to entertain my son and being able to get him to, to laugh and play along with the silly games that I play. And all of that does track back to, you know, being creative as a dancer, as a host, you know, as a radio presenter, all of the, the creative juices that need to flow in order for you to actually be successful in your job apply to that element of fatherhood of being able to entertain your kids, which is half the battle most of the time, especially as he's a toddler right now and requires so much more attention than what I'm used to every day. It's kind of entertain me and do it now. <laughs> uh, all right. You know, the listeners were following along. They, they, they were buying what you were selling until you got <laughs> to the sort of entertainment value of changing a baby's diaper or nappy. Oh, you're yeah. going to say, I mean, it is the most mundane thing that parents do generations past men would brag about never having changed a diaper, which is of course 
nonsense and ridiculous because it's really just technical and it's not like diapers are terribly difficult to operate these days. Yeah. Uh, how does something that mundane, that but also that relatable, because we've all done it thousands and thousands of times, how does that become you know, the idea for the first piece of dad content you posted? Well, it's, I guess there's two parts to it. The first part being that it was kind of a totally off the cuff thing that my mother-in-law had noticed me singing, dancing, behaving stupidly in order to distract my son so that I could quickly change his diaper and that he wouldn't try and, you know, alligator roll off the, off the table or kick his legs or anything. So trying to kind of lock in his focus. He was obviously very little at the time. I think he was only three weeks old when I did the first video. So it was, ex he was extremely small. And I guess it was just me being silly. She said, that's hilarious. You should record that and then post it somewhere. And then that's, I had a, a TikTok account and I decided to go, okay, well, instead of posting the usual stuff that I post on Instagram, why don't I just try posting a dad video? And then that's kind of, that was the beginning of this whole tidal wave. Um, and, and then guess, what happened though, like, but what happened was like, tell the story of how like the next day or 24 hours later. Yeah. Oh, well, I so I basically posted this video and it obviously resonated with a lot of people, a lot of parents. And then the following day, you know, I didn't think about it. I left it on TikTok and was like, cool. Went back to Instagram because that was the kind of the social media platform I was most, I don't know, using the most at the time. And the following day, so it must have been about 24 hours later, it was early afternoon. My, my partner said, oh, how's your TikTok video doing, by the way? You posted one yesterday. And I was like, oh, yeah, I did. And I clicked on my account. And it said 100,000 followers. And I was like, I've definitely clicked on the wrong account. What's going on? And I surfed through the app going, what kind of mistake is this? And I eventually got to the video and I clicked on it. And the video had 5 million views. And I was like, oh, so I have 100,000 followers now. <laughs> I guess I have some sort of responsibility. I mean, what do I do? And then Jamie just said to me, make another one. And so <laughs> it became this snowball of, you know, at this point in time, like I said, he's three weeks old. So we're changing about five diapers a day. Yeah. So I thought, well, then why don't I just film one of those each day and then do a little bit of editing to it and see how it goes. And then, yeah, this snowball effect kept happening. And within about I think it was about five months. We started in April and by August we had a million followers on TikTok, which is crazy. But the thing, other thing I was going to say about it is that not only was it because that I think the success of this has kind of bled into TikTok is obviously because the entertainment value, like we've already spoken about, I'm behaving silly and you know, it's, it's a, um, it's, it's entertainment value. The other side of it is also that we've surpassed this point in social media where glamorizing your life is no longer A, believable, but also B, people don't want to see that anymore. We've got to a point where, you know, with the with the kind of nudge of reality TV as well, that that's the way we like to consume social media as well. We want to see real things, real people doing real things. And yeah, okay, maybe a bit of entertainment sprinkled in there as well, but no one, I don't feel like people resonate as much with someone laying on a beach and saying how great their life is. I mean, we're in the trenches, we're parents, we're changing diapers, we're doing feeding time and there's baked beans going up the walls and people want to see that because it's what resonates with them and makes people feel like they're not alone in their journey of the same thing. I, I don't know, Barney, you, you've got this figured out more than I do, but I can imagine <laughs> a video of, of your partner, Jamie, like on the beach and then it pans to you in like a tropical outfit doing some sort of jazz hands type routine <laughs> as you change it up. No? no, I mean, it's definitely possible. We did, um, do you our can, first. You can take that idea. You can have it. I'll I will. I'll idea. run with it. Yeah, why not? We, we, uh, we basically did our first long haul trip on a flight with rocket when he was just before he was one, we went to Bali and it took 23 and a half hours to get there. Uh, but with a kid that's not walking yet, it's actually yeah. not that bad. But I guess with a toddler, it would be an absolute nightmare. So, yeah, we did that. And we actually managed to do some fun videos with him while we were in Bali as well. And that was quite a, a nice change of pace and change of scenery, at least. You know, any TikTok video, not to judge, but any TikTok video is going to be by design short. Um, and obviously it takes mm. longer to, to film it. But what is the behind the scenes? What is the behind the scenes when you and your partner are thinking, okay, uh, is this something that is cute and funny? that's appropriate for us to put out there or is this something that's cute and funny but maybe we should keep it private because you know you, you are a very successful influencer but 
but first you're a dad. So what does that, you know, conversation, internal dialogue look like? Yeah, this is actually like quite a, um, you know, an important topic that's being spoken about, I think quite a lot on social media, especially a, a surrounding family content creators that are on YouTube at the moment, because, you know, the word like exploitation is kind of being thrown around a lot. Um, when it comes to family content creators, I guess the way that I've always kind of looked at it is from the direction of this is content that I would still be doing the exact same thing if it wasn't, if the, if the camera wasn't there, I don't, none of this content is forced. None, all of this content is just stuff that we do on a day-to-day -day basis as parents. I guess that's how, that's how I justify it. The kind of the content that I make. Um, it's all feeding time. It's, it's, you know, diaper changing, it's whatever. And I guess the primary focus of these videos, I guess I try to try to like over 90% of the time have the focal point of the content as being myself rather than my son. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I'm the entertainer. He's a byproduct of it. So it's like, yeah, I'm changing your diaper, but the entertainment factor is coming from me. And it's not just me filming him and going do something funny. I guess that for me makes it makes the kind of the focal point of the content, not all about, you know, my son and I want to protect him as much as I can anyway, like within his, like in his early years. So we just try to make the content as much about us as opposed to just being singularly about him. Which of course then makes, if it, yeah, it makes sorry. sense because it makes sense because your audience is parents, your audience is not. Yeah toddlers your your audience of parents who want to relate to what you're doing yeah and i feel like we we do a good job of that and it, it also allows for the fact that you know maybe when he's older and if he just goes you know what i'm actually kind of sick and tired of recording stuff or like i don't want to do any of this or something then it's not going to be like okay we'll just cut everything out or we'll just remove everything or the channel will just disappear it's still just about me and jamie because we you know, agree that we'd like to continue making like parenting content with or without our kids. Yeah, but l l let's be honest, Barney. And I know you've got a. a He's one the of star your, of the show. I know. One, <laughs> one of your one of your one of your sponsors is Pampers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is a good sponsor. I mean, what happens when like poor Rocket is like seven years old and he says, "Dad, <laughs> for the love of God, will you potty train me? Come on, exactly. get a di get a different sponsor, Dad. Come on." <laughs> Tell me about it. It's very, it's very interesting having, you know, a brand that has like a lifespan, like there is a lifespan to it. There, there is a cutoff point, of course. And I think that for us, we're open with communication with everyone that we work with that, you know, there are boundaries that will be set to a degree. And then also, I think that the funny thing is, is we, we have conversations with them and say, you know, what does the future look like? Because obviously you have you know, nighttime diapers for kids who are potty trained, but maybe still wet the bed. And then further beyond that, you've got wipes and, you know, they're kind of, they're well aware of it and we are too. So I guess it's, there is an element of future proofing that we try to do in terms of like, what does the future look like for this? But at the moment, you know, every, everything is still fairly early stages. I would say we're only like, he's not even two years old. So we're just kind of rolling with it, to be honest, because I, uh, Sponsors will come and go. I'm, and I'm it just I'm kind of is this, what it is. I'm having this picture <laughs> in my mind. You know, every parent in the world, in the Western world, uses M&Ms to potty train their child. They're small. They're sweet. Really? They're Interesting. Are, you're going to okay. be giving, you're going to give this poor kid, he's like, here's some Brussels sprouts. How would yeah. you like some, like, <laughs> I'll give you a leaf of spinach. Oh, you don't want to go? Okay, let's back to the trip. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Actually, funnily enough, you say that. My mom helped potty train my, my, my brother's kids. And they were having, like, I wouldn't say difficulty with it, but you know, it can be a bit of a, a battle to do it. And so my mom was like, are you going to let me do it my way? And my brother was like, okay, fine. And it was one sweet for a number one and two sweets for a number two. <laughs> and she was like, had them trained in three days. Done. So I, I, I was wanna, like, okay, I might take that. I want to pause it here for people who've been listening since the beginning, because um, we're talking about potty training. We're talking about changing diapers from a man who danced with Sir Elton John. So this for every parent out there, every dad out there, like, you know, we all go through changes in our lives, right? You know, we, we evolve. Big time. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Like to think that, you know, one of my last ever dance jobs, I was dancing for Katy Perry. And, and then to think that 
only it was us 20 so I think that you know six years later my my life career completely changed like at that point in my life I didn't even know about esports either when I was like 25 it was and so but from the age of 26 27 to kind of go oh that sounds fun I'll go and do that it's hilarious if you'd have told 25 year old me what I'm doing right now he'd go you've been smoking something (laughs) (laughs) you know I think every I've got three kids you know three daughters they're they're way past this stage but each one was so very different and I remember putting them to bed at night and you know one was a good sleeper the other was the worst sleeper ever and the other the last one I think put herself to sleep on her own when she was like three weeks old she just wanted (laughs) this but there would be these moments when you're trying to get your child to sleep and you, you can't make any noise. You can't really listen to anything, but you can watch stuff and you can watch stuff on your phone and you can watch, you know, videos like you're, you're making on TikTok. And, and obviously lots of parents are, are doing that. What are the comments that you get from, from people mm. who are engaging with your, your content? You know, supportive ones, obviously, but also if, if yeah. you take you to, yeah, I mean, I will. Yeah. Care. I mean, of course we want to hear about the bad ones. Of course we do. Um, <laughs> Barney, so- you call that a diaper change. You yeah, don't know exactly. what, you're, you don't know <laughs> shit, man. Exactly. Um, nine, I will say 95% of the comments are always positive because ultimately the goal of this content anyway is, is to just be positive and be entertaining and have fun. Um, the 5% that aren't so much typically is just someone trying to get your attention or just, you know, pee on your parade, essentially. Um, some which of would them not happen, it, which would not happen if they were wearing a diaper. They would not be exactly, able to pee on exactly, exactly, exactly. I'll send some your way. Don't worry <laughs> on the house. Um, yeah. So some of them are, we call them Karens in the comments. Um, they, you know, it'll be, you didn't pick him up correctly or, You shouldn't be feeding him that. You should have cut his food up smaller. Uh, And it's just all stuff like that. It's just people, you know, either deflecting onto you or just ultimately trying to get your attention. So it's not, I'd never take it seriously. I don't really get affected by the comments. My partner gets affected by them more. And so I just say to her, just stop reading them then because it's not going to matter. I do read the comments because I actually do like the constructive criticism that you are very occasionally get, which will be, Oh, I'm a midwife. I've done this, this, and this. I've noticed this. Have you checked this out? You know, whether or not, if he has like a little rash on his leg or, you know, maybe you should try doing this when you do a diaper change, because we found that using this ointment prevents X, Y, and Z. I've, I've found those comments really helpful. And I reply to them and say, thank you so much. We'll try it. Um, so you find that, you know, parents are very vocal online, yeah. very vocal because, you know, you're the, I guess there is a supportive element to it. And there's also a bit of a know-it-all element to it of people going, I've done this three times and I've got three daughters and I can tell you what I, how to do it. Listen to me, Barney. I got some advice yeah, for you. I know what I, I know what I'm talking about. about three. <laughs> um, so yeah, that ultimately majority positive, couple of negative ones thrown in the mix, of course. Um, but nothing, the scary ones are the people that recognize us when we're on the streets or in the shops and go, I saw you at the supermarket today. And then you go, Ooh. Yeah. if you do come and say hi, otherwise yeah. I'm going to think this is really creepy. Yeah, next time, yeah. <laughs> Just, hey, how you doing? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Just something. So good. Uh, Barney Banks, thank you for being my guest on the company of dad's podcast. One final question for you you know as you do this you you've, you've created a community you you're, you're building something that's connecting with with parents um i don't want to put too much pressure on you but if you were to you know th- those early years can be s- stressful you know you, you you found a way to bring humor and entertainment to it what are what some bits of advice would you share uh with our listeners who who maybe you know are, are having a little tougher go of it getting through those those early years I think that um, more and more often at the moment, I'm seeing, you know how on social media, some people have quotes or they have videos that are narrated by someone, you know, saying an inspirational uh, piece of text. And I think that uh, so much that I come across is always about embracing the moments when your children are the youngest. And, you know, they always end up saying something along the lines of, you know, you don't get those moments back. And then there will be a time when it is the last time you pick your kid up 
like there is a time and that time is on its way. And so for me, I know that humor and entertainment, not, o- not only as a, you know, a career path for myself, let's say, it's also a coping mechanism for me. If I'm having a rough go at it or there's a rough few days, humor, entertainment kind of picks me up out of that, out of that pocket. And I think that if you can find that and just don't take everything so seriously, we're in an age where everything online is taken extremely seriously and for the most part for good cause. But I feel like we're losing, uh, we're losing our kind of, we're getting a bit out of touch with the entertaining, the humor and the enjoyment that comes with young kids. Don't fight against it, like go with it because yeah, you don't want to have an eight year old or a 10 year old and think, oh, we should have, I wish I'd had more fun or, you know, had more of those good times when, when we were younger. So I guess for me, I'm embracing as much of it as I can. It doesn't make it easy. It's, there's still really tough moments, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm learning as well as everyone else. People turn to me like I'm an expert and honestly, I'm just trying to have fun as a dad. So yeah, I guess don't take yourself too seriously and just enjoy these moments while you still can. That's a perfect last line. Just try to have fun (laughs) as a dad on TikTok, I am Mr. Banks, Barney Banks. Thank you again for joining us on the company dad podcast. Thanks so much, Paul. Thank you for listening to the company of dads podcast. I also want to thank the people who make this podcast and everything else that we do with the company of dads possible. Helder Mira, who is our audio producer, Lindsay Decker, who handles all of our social media, Terry Brennan, who's helping us with the newsletter and audience acquisition, Emily Servin, who is our web maestro, and of course, Evan Roosevelt, who is working side by side with me in many of the things that we do here at the company of dads. It's a great team. Um, and we're, we're just trying to bring you the best in fatherhood. Remember, the one-stop shop for everything is our newsletter, The Dad. Sign up at thecompanyofdads.com backslash the dad. Thank you again for listening.